Welcome to Vickers PEDs. I'm Coach Steve. Let's talk about boldenone and dehydroboldenone. Put that all together in one video. And let's go over everything. Starting right at the beginning when boldenone was developed by SIBA alongside the Anabol. Now similar to how Mastron, Superdrol and Anadrol were developed at the same time. Both the Anabol and boldenone were developed at the same time around the late 1940s and medically approved around the early 1950s. Nowadays, the Anabol is still medically approved. I believe it's still used in cases of androgen deficiency. But after the 1970s, boldenone was no longer approved for human consumption, but it's still used as a veterinary drug in race horses and race camels, I believe. So boldenone is no longer FDA approved for humans, but it is still available as an FDA approved veterinary medication. I believe that before the 1970s, boldenone was used in cases of androgen deficiency, osteoporosis, or several muscle wasting diseases. And even though boldenone has a tendency to increase hematocrit and promote red blood cell production, it was never approved for the treatment of anemias. Now, what is medically prescribed in cases of anemia is anadrol, oxymethylone. And that was developed by Syntex around the mid 1960s. So I'm not sure if the development of anadrol caused the discontinuation of boldenone. Even though boldenone was never used to promote red blood cell count in cases of anemia, anadrol is a medically approved alternative for that effect. So I'm not sure if that was a contributing factor. I believe they've developed several other medications which are more suitable for androgen deficiency, osteoporosis, and muscle wasting diseases. So since the 70s, FDA approved boldenone is no longer available and the only way you can source that is through the underground route or you have to use veterinary medication. Now, veterinary medication are only 50 milligrams of boldenone and decinate per milliliter and for all bodybuilding purposes it's going to result in a very high voluminous injection so I would I would personally I would not consider to use veterinary medication if I wanted to use boldenone again. Dehydroboldenone is a 5 alpha reduced metabolite of boldenone, which has gotten a little bit of notoriety over the last 5 years, maybe 10 years. So normally, people that would use boldenone would get dehydroboldenone for free through 5 alpha reductase, so similar as testosterone converts to 5 alpha reductase into dehydrotestosterone, boldenone converts into dehydroboldenone. Now, the rate of conversion I'm not really sure of. I believe it's less than testosterone to dehydrotestosterone. So when you look at the conversion rate, it's usually about 5 to 10% from testosterone to dehydrotestosterone. We need to look at the serum concentrations. On paper, testosterone has an anabolic to androgenic ratio of 100 to 100. And boldenone has an anabolic to androgenic ratio of 100 to 50. So the androgenic ratio is about half that of testosterone. Now, this ratio goes out the door when you use finasteride because some of the androgenicity, of course, comes from one of the metabolites, dehydrotestosterone or dehydroboldenone. Again, that's on paper, so you can completely forego this anabolic to androgenic ratio when you include a 5 alpha reductase inhibitor like finasteride, dutasteride, or sol palmetto for that matter. Now, unfortunately, this ratio is not known for dehydroboldenone by itself, but if we go by the difference between testosterone and boldenone, we can kind of deduct this ratio from dehydrotestosterone, which has an anabolic rating of 60 to 220 and an androgenic ratio of 30 to 260. So going by the same anabolic rating of testosterone and boldenone, dehydroboldenone would have about half the androgenicity of dehydrotestosterone, resulting in an androgenic rating of 15 to 130. And the anabolic rating would be exactly the same as dehydrotestosterone, again, because testosterone and boldenone have the same anabolic rating. So dehydroboldenone would have an anabolic rating of 60 to 220 and an androgenic rating, which is about half, 15 to 130. Yeah, it's pure speculation. Again, it's all on paper. <laughs> and whether you use dehydroboldenone directly or you'd get DHB as a freebie from boldenone administrations. Now the conversion rate, we can kind of calculate this way as well, because the androgenic ratio of boldenone is about half that of testosterone, considering some of the androgenicity is coming from its metabolites, the dehydroboldenone or the dehydrotestosterone. Testosterone converts into dehydrotestosterone, 5 to 10%. So let's say, let's speculate, let's put it on paper. Boldenone converts into dehydroboldenone, 50% at rate. 
resulting in a percentage of 5 to 2.5%. Speculation, interesting to keep into consideration. Okay, that out of the way. When is boldenone used? Or when is dehydroboldenone used? I made another video about finding out your minimal and maximal tolerable dose of testosterone when you figure that out for yourself, whether that's 2,000 milligrams, 1,000 milligrams, or 500 milligrams of testosterone, whatever is the maximum dose for you, and you're considering another anabolic, I think boldenone is probably going to be one of the early choices. So, for example, you've maxed out your results on 750 milligrams of testosterone in a caloric surplus. I have to emphasize it, guys. In a caloric surplus, please. Yeah, no need to up the dose if you're not increasing your calories first. So you've maxed out your results on a caloric surplus and 750 milligrams of testosterone per week. Increasing the dose of testosterone to 1,000 milligrams per week gives you intolerable side effects. And in that case, if more recovery and anabolism is desired, boldenone or dehydroboldenone is a considerable option. Now we look at, again, the anabolic to androgenic ratio from testosterone to boldenone. I feel that on paper, and from the results that I've gotten and all of my clients on a milligram for milligram basis, testosterone and boldenone are going to give equal results. You, know, you might get a little bit of less androgenic effect from boldenone itself compared to testosterone. But when it comes to anabolism and overall recovery, I feel that the dosages are going to be the same. So if you wanted to increase from 750 milligrams of testosterone to 1000 milligrams of testosterone, you keep it at 750 and you increase with 250 milligrams boldenone instead. Now, a lot of the formulations come in 300 milligrams per milliliter. I believe in keeping it easy. So if that's the case, that's going to be 750 milligrams of testosterone and 300 milligrams of boldenone per week on top. Because dehydroboldenone has a higher anabolic rating and androgenic rating compared to testosterone, and you don't get to choose how much testosterone converts into DHT unless you're using a 5-alpha reductase inhibitor, I believe that the dosage of dehydrotestosterone can be reduced in relation to the increment of testosterone that you wanted to make. So instead of 250 tests or 300 milligrams of boldenone, I would consider 150 to 200 milligrams of dehydroboldenone as the next increment to improve anabolism. What I'd like to do when I added the boldenone to my off-season cycles is get a one-to-one -one ratio between testosterone and boldenone. So let's say I ended up at 750 milligrams of boldenone and I wanted to increase the overall anabolism to 1,000 milligrams of anabolics per week, reduce testosterone to 500 milligrams a week and add 500 milligrams of boldenone on top from the beginning. But I already had experience with boldenone. And if you don't have experience with boldenone, I would recommend everybody to start a little bit lower at maybe 250 to 300 milligrams per week and assess your tolerance because boldenone, like all the other steroids, come with side effects which might manifest or might not manifest for you. And the only way you'll know is by starting low and increasing your dosages as needed. And over time, figure out what is your personal maximum tolerable dose of boldenone or dehydroboldenone for that matter. So I prefer to start with testosterone and boldenone in a one-to-one -one ratio. With the main reason being, boldenone would give me a more rounder appearance. And it's the same for most of my clients who follow this ratio of one-to-one testosterone to boldenone so you compare that to a thousand milligrams of testosterone to 500 test 500 boldenone in that case the appearance would be a little bit rounder and it would also reduce the requirement for additional aromatized inhibitors the reduction of serum estradiol levels comes through several different pathways the first of them is of course you're reducing the testosterone from 750 to 500 milligrams per week less test means less estrogen conversion Boldenone does convert to estrogen, albeit at a much lower rate. Now it's long believed and plastered and regurgitated all over the internet that boldenone converts about 50% that of testosterone. I don't believe that's the case. I don't believe that at all. Boldenone does convert to estradiol. But the rate of conversion highly depends on your body fat levels, your injection frequency, the carrier oil, how much testosterone is used because it might catalyze the conversion of testosterone into estrogen. So what I predominantly see or what I saw with myself is that by adding boldenone to testosterone I would require less aromacin compared to the same dose of testosterone per week without the boldenone. So you're increasing your overall anabolic intake 
but the requirement for aromacin went down. And I see the same thing with clients. Even though some of the clients had higher body fat, they will still see a higher rate of conversion. And again, I highly believe that the body fat, where most of the aromatization occurs, highly contributes to how much extra or reduction of aromatized activity you'll get by adding boldenone to your PAD protocol. So, blood work, yeah, serum estradiol concentrations, check that with blood work before you add in boldenone or dehydroboldenone to your stack. Now, dehydroboldenone is already 5-alpha reduced. It's not going to convert into estradiol, but it does have potent anti-estrogenic effects which is probably caused because dehydroboldenone has affinity for the aromatized enzyme and temporarily blocks the conversion of testosterone into estradiol in the same way that mastrone or provirin temporarily blocks this conversion by taking testosterone place in the aromatized enzyme. Now, boldenone is a little bit more unique because boldenone can convert into estradiol, but three of its metabolites are known to act as an aromatized inhibitor themselves. So most notably, that's 1AD, 1,4-AD, or ADD. If you have ADD in your bloodstream, but it's not attention deficit disorder, write me a comment down below. You've made it this far, prove it by posting a comment. And the third metabolite with aromatized inhibiting properties is ADT, which I believe was actually used in a product from Guspari Nutrition called Novadex or Novadex XT in combination with arimistane. So that was two steroidal aromatized inhibitors in one product, ATD, boldenone metabolite, and arimistane, which was not FDA approved, unlike aromacin. Aromacin and arimistane are both suicide inhibitors to get stuck in the aromatized enzyme and prevent it from acting on testosterone converting into estradiol. So that's a permanent suicide aromatized inhibitor but I'm not exactly sure if these boldenone metabolites, ATD, 1,4-AD, or 1-AD, are permanent suicide inhibitors or temporarily block the aromatized enzyme, preventing the conversion of testosterone into estradiol. Man, wasn't there like a pro-hormone that contained 1-androstenediol, which converts into 1-AD or 1,4-AD inside the body acting as an aromatized inhibitor? And those, those, those pro-hormone days, it's um, good, but mostly bad memories. <laughs> Superdrol is still good. I'll give Superdrol that. That's still a good pro-hormone, even though it was developed by Syntex alongside Mastron and Anadrol. A pharmaceutical company actually developed it, and most of the other designer steroid pro-hormones never FDA approved. So I, don't, I wouldn't want to touch it. And, you know, if boldenone converts into some of these metabolites with anti-estrogenic properties... Hey, another freebie, right? It helps. Helps to reduce the need for additional aromatized inhibitor. Or you might actually be able to get away with no aromatized inhibitor at all because boldenone metabolites or dehydroboldenone provide a sufficient amount of suppression of aromatized activity, keeping your serum estradiol in you know, favorable ranges. And whatever range that is depends on the off-season, the cutting phase, and where your sex drive is best. So that's one of the unique characteristics of boldenone. Three of its metabolites have anti androgenic properties, and the same can be said for dehydroboldenone. Even though it doesn't have the same metabolites, it could still lower serum estradiol level, depending on the dose and the other aromatizable compounds that you're using in your performance-enhancing drug protocol. Okay, keep that in mind. Blood work, serum estradiol levels, before, during, and after and adjust your aromatized inhibitor protocol, actual aromatized inhibitor protocol, so that's the aromacin, arimidex, or maybe dinylmethane and calcium deglucrate, adjust it accordingly based on your blood work results. Okay, let's move on to sex hormone binding globulin, because estrogen and sex hormone binding globulin are functionally related. Serum estradiol increases sex hormone binding globulin levels, and sex hormone binding globulin binds, as the name implies, Bind sex hormones, including boldenone or dehydroboldenone, and either temporarily, temporarily prevents that from working, keeps it in the bloodstream, or it delivers it to the tissue. Now, when you get estrogenic reduction from adding boldenone and the boldenone metabolites reduce serum estradiol levels, sex hormone binding globulin is going to go down. Now, what is the case with dehydroboldenone, and the same can be said for all the other DHT-based compounds, with moderate affinity for the sex hormone binding globulin, 
DHB or any of the other DHT-based compounds displace testosterone from the sexual binding globulin. But they also do the same in the aromatized enzyme. Now, free testosterone concentration in the bloodstream increases, which you would think it means more sex drive. But generally speaking, because estrogen levels go down and sexual binding globulin goes down, sex drive might be impacted through a different pathway. But you also might lose some of the anabolic effect, which comes from testosterone or any of the other sex hormones, which get delivered with sex hormone binding globulin through the sex hormone binding globulin receptor complex. And I know that's a little bit new science. It might be a little bit controversial. General consensus is that free testosterone levels or free serum concentrations of anabolic steroids in the bloodstream are the most anabolic thing ever. Just remember, muscles are not in the bloodstream. And the only thing in the bloodstream that has androgen receptors is white blood cells. So the more free androgens you have in your bloodstream, the lower your white blood cells are going to be, might reduce your immune system. A controversial thought for you to think about. So if your sex hormone binding globulin reduces into the single digits, you might not get the most anabolic response that you could have for that amount of androgens or anabolics that you're taking. Personally, for me, boldenone didn't reduce my sex hormone binding globulin levels that much. Again, I control my estrogen and keep that in a favorable range, which works for me around 55 picograms, maybe even 75 picograms per milliliter. And the clients that have used dehydroboldenone, I see a significant reduction with a similar amount of estrogen during the off-season. Again, I like to keep the estrogen a little bit higher during the off-season because estrogen gives you anabolic effect as well. If you didn't know that, now you know. But you see that the sexual hormone binding globulin on dehydroboldenone with the same amount of estrogen in comparing milligram for milligram boldenone and dehydroboldenone together, sexual hormone binding globulin goes down a little bit. And in most cases, you need less aromatized inhibitors on boldenone compared to dehydroboldenone. Again, it's just from the experience that I've seen with clients that have used both compounds. Because personally, I haven't used dehydroboldenone, so I'm just going by the blood work that I've seen with some of my clients that have used it. I feel that boldenone is reasonably safe when it comes to hair loss and the progression of androgenetic alopecia or for the guys that are prone to developing male pattern baldness. And even though boldenone converts into dehydroboldenone, it's quite a low amount and you should be able to prevent the conversion with finasteride. So if you're suffering from hair loss and you're keeping your testosterone at the lowest effective dose of a hormone replacement and you're blocking the conversion of testosterone into dehydrotestosterone with a 5-alpha reductase inhibitor, I feel that the addition of boldenone on top of your maximum tolerable dose of testosterone with regards to hair loss, I feel that this addition of boldenone doesn't require you to increase your 5-alpha reductase inhibitors, again, because boldenone doesn't convert to dehydroboldenone that much but i don't think that dehydroboldenone is suitable when you're prone to hair loss because it's already 5 alpha reduced and it's a dht based compound and besides dehydronandrolone i feel that most of the dht based compounds increase the rate of progression of androgenetic alopecia to a certain extent and it might not be the same extent as mastron or primabolin or provirin do I feel that boldenone, in case of hair loss and androgenetic alopecia, I feel that boldenone is a suitable replacement or addition to testosterone, and dehydroboldenone is not a suitable option. And I can verify that with some of my clients, and even though they didn't experience immediate hair loss, like can be seen with mastron, for example, where you almost get bald overnight if you're prone to androgenetic alopecia, it's not that dramatic, but it's clearly noticeable, you scratch your head and it's all falling down in the sink. That wasn't the case with dehydroboldenone, but they did notice increased acne formation, maybe a little bit more oily skin, and androgen-induced hair growth on the chest, abdomen, privates, back, anywhere you don't really want hair growth. And based on these androgenic side effects, I feel that dehydroboldenone will still cause some sort of hair loss, even though it might not be noticeable at the time you're running it. So if you're running it in a short duration of eight weeks, maybe 12 weeks as part of a steroid cycle, the hair loss might not be noticeable. But if you do multiple cycles, years on end of dehydroboldenone, I'm sure you'll experience a little bit of hair loss if you're prone to it. So keep that in mind. I feel that boldenone is a lot safer on the hairline compared to running dehydroboldenone by itself. Moving on to red blood cell production and 
hematocrit levels, it doesn't happen for everybody. And I, I think it highly depends on how your diet is structured. So if your diet is high in dietary iron and vitamin B12 coming from animal sources, so let's say the carnivore diet, for example, yes, you'll see a significant amount of hematocrit and red blood cell production. But if you're a vegan and your dietary intake of iron and vitamin B12 is low, even though you're supplementing with it, which has lower bioavailability compared to the animal-based sources, I feel in this when you're comparing these two situations, carnivores to vegans, vegans using boldenone will probably see similar hematocrit levels and carnivores using boldenone will probably need to donate every 60 days to keep their hematocrit in range. So depending on your dietary intake and your food choices, you might have to donate frequently or you might not have to donate at all. Personally, following a pescatarian diet of mostly fish and some plant-based sources, eggs, I don't eat so much beef unless it comes in a hamburger on a Sunday evening, my serum iron, ferritin, transferrin, total iron binding capacity are all somewhere in the middle of the range. In my case, boldenone did not really increase my hematocrit and red blood cell production. It might not be the case for you. Again, what I mentioned in the testosterone video, if your hematocrit and red blood cell production is already high before adding boldenone, you might want to look for a suitable alternative and you might not be able to donate frequently enough to keep your hematocrit and your red blood cell count in range when you're using boldenone. Or you might have to schedule a therapeutic phlebotomy at the hospital. It's a little bit difficult sometimes. The doctors are not very forthcoming. So most of us do donations here in Thailand. I can't even do a donation. So I have to get a rogue nurse to do that for me. A different story for a different video. Or you'll have to look into chelation therapy or IP6 supplementation. Calcium disodium EDTA reduces heavy metals and iron from the bloodstream and detoxifies that through the kidneys. And IP6 actually prevents the absorption of dietary iron, lowering serum iron and ferritin levels. But honestly, in most cases, people completely overdo these supplements and then you get these weird complete blood count readings, a very high red cell distribution width where the red blood cells are way too large because you're preventing the absorption or you're increasing the detoxification of iron. So now the hemoglobin doesn't have enough iron, reducing oxygen carrying capacity of the blood. Your red blood cell count goes up. Your mean complex hemoglobin size is down. It's a disaster. <laughs> so please keep track of your complete blood count and find a place where you can do donations before you decide to add boldenone to your PED protocol. I can't say that I saw dramatic hematocrit increases on the clients that did use dehydroboldenone. But again, that might not be the case for you. So the same applies if you're deciding to add dehydroboldenone or boldenone to your performance enhancing drug stack. Keep track of your complete blood count. Make sure your hematocrit doesn't go too high or you don't get these skewed readings of red cell distribution with mean corpus volume, serum iron levels. Keep track of all of that and, and find a place where you can donate frequently in case your hematocrit goes too high and then choose to go with a power red donation which only takes the red blood cells from your blood and returns the plasma which contains the hemoglobin the iron the b vitamins and blood sugar so you don't fade during or after the donation yeah, keep that in mind let's go over the esters boldenone comes in boldenone acetate cypionate and undecalinate and dehydroboldenone usually comes in acetate and cypionate now, of those five options, personally, I would only choose for boldenone and decunate and dehydroboldenone cypionate. The acetate ester is incredibly painful. And I've seen that with a lot of clients. They're like, yes, fast acting boldenone. Let's go. Almost like injectable Dianabol without the guaiacol. And they regret it. It's probably more painful than testosterone suspension. And I've seen people crippled from either boldenone acetate or dehydroboldenone acetate. And I think when dehydroboldenone cypionate came on the market, it was incredibly painful as well. But that could also be because the ester separates from the active pharmaceutical ingredient, in this case, dehydroboldenone or boldenone. Acetate or cypionate separates, and now you have dehydroboldenone suspension and a separate ester attachment. And when you inject that, there's no need for lipases and esterases to cleave those esters off. And you basically get the same effect as testosterone suspension or Winslow suspension, irritating the tissue. Now, 
from what I've heard, not my personal experience, from what I've heard, whatever dehydroboldenone cypionate is on the market now is not as painful as the initial products that were developed, but it's still more painful compared to boldenone deculate, equipoise, which is basically post-injection pain free, unless you're injecting into virgin muscle or you're using an underground lab, which uses synthetic carrier oil. Don't worry, I won't bore you with that. Just make sure it's in organic carrier oil because that synthetic might cause cardiovascular disease. And that's what we're trying to avoid here. Yeah? If you want to use anabolics, make sure you stay as healthy as possible in the process. Hair loss is not as bad as cardiovascular disease. Now, before we wrap up this video, I'd like to mention that boldenone was shown to be kidney toxic in several different animal studies. And it was shown in a dose dependent fashion. So the more boldenone you take, the more potential for renal toxicity and glomerular sclerosis you can induce. Now, it doesn't really play out in the real world because I've never heard anybody get kidney damage from using boldenone, even at higher dosages of 1,200 to 1,500 milligrams per week on top of, let's say, 1,000 milligrams to 1,500 milligrams of testosterone, which is 3,000 milligrams of anabolics per week combined. And these guys weren't even that big and they probably weren't controlling their blood pressure either. But even in those cases, there was no clear signs of renal impairment or renal toxicity, and their estimated glomerular filtration rate was still over 100. Now, I'm not sure if it would still be over 100 after years of consistent boldenone use, but personally, I haven't seen any anecdotal evidence that boldenone causes any renal impairment, even with prolonged exposure. Now, I'm not sure if that's the case for dehydroboldenone as well. I believe it hasn't been studied in the same setting as boldenone was in those animal studies. It's just something you need to take into consideration and make sure that your blood pressure, which is a highly contributing factor in the progression of glomerular sclerosis. And it took me 20 takes to pronounce that correctly. So I'm gonna move on. Some of these medical terms sound like Klingon. I'm done with it. I'm done taking these takes over and over again, just to pronounce glomerular sclerosis correctly. So when you compare boldenone to trembolone, which were both shown to be kidney toxic in several animal studies, I think that trembolone, that effect of trembolone plays out in the real world. So I've heard several people get kidney issues from prolonged trembolone exposure, but it's not the case with boldenone. Now again, boldenone is an off-season compound in most settings, and trembolone is a contest prep or cutting phase compound, often in combination with other compounds that might increase blood pressure. And then perhaps using diuretics at the end, which is going to exacerbate kidney impairment even further. So all these factors contribute. Please keep it into consideration before adding boldenone or trembolone for that matter. So all things considering, would I use boldenone again? No, not really. I think primobolin is a far superior compound and it's available in pharmaceutical grade, which is the handicap I gave myself going forward. I only want to use pharmaceutical grade and veterinary grade is not really appealing to me. Plus the results I got from boldenone are comparable to primabolin, but I don't get that anxiety effect with primabolin like a lot of people experience with boldenone. And I got that effect as well. I completely overlooked that in this video. I highly suggest you go to Leo and Longevity's channel who has a very lengthy series about GABA and GABAergic response to certain performance enhancing drugs. And he explains that very well, so I highly suggest you watch his GABA and serotonin series on the Leo and Longevity channel. Personally, I'm not interested in experimenting with dehydroboldenone. I've done a lot of research on it, and based on the results that I've seen with some of my clients that did use dehydroboldenone, I still feel that primabolin is a superior compound. So I'll stick with that. Whatever you decide to do with your body is completely your decision and your responsibility. I hope I made this video informative for you. Thank you guys so much for watching. See you in the next one.